walking in a park one day when, ow, you accidentally got bitten by a mosquito. Your new itchy mosquito bite has you thinking, why haven't we eradicated mosquitoes yet? You decide to look up different resources on mosquito control efforts. Luckily, you stumble upon a pamphlet that discusses this issue from the perspective of science, society, government, and industry. Right now, you're thinking about all the money that you could make if you created your own mosquito repellent. So this makes you look at the industry section first. Let's learn about the industry of mosquito eradication. There are a number of different diseases that mosquitoes can transmit, including the Zika virus, dengue virus, and malaria, as well as many others. Worldwide, this means that mosquitoes cause a lot more harm than just causing an itchy red bump on your arm. Now that we know how important mosquito eradication is, let's look at some of the current products that are available. While mosquito repellents are a billion dollar industry, today we'll be focusing only on mosquito eradication. We will be focusing on the Wolbachia mosquito as well as GMO mosquitoes. So what is a Wolbachia mosquito? Wolbachia is a type of bacteria that is found in some mosquitoes. Let's call this mosquito here our Wolbachia mosquito. When it mates or breeds with another mosquito that doesn't have Wolbachia, the end result is that the eggs produced are not hatchable. This makes the population of mosquitoes go down. Now let's look at genetically modified mosquitoes. A special gene known as a self-limiting gene can be inserted into mosquitoes. What this means is that when the mosquitoes lay eggs, they are unable to hatch, which again reduces the number of mosquitoes that are in the population. Now let's look at how much this would cost. One study in the Journal of Neglected Tropical Diseases estimated that in Brazil, for a city of around 400,000 people, it would cost 1.1 million US dollars for two years. This works out to being $10 per person. This can be quite expensive for a country. This begs the question, is this price justified? This leads us to our first main question. What responsibilities do companies that create mosquito eradication products have? Now that we know a bit about the industry, let's look into the science of mosquito eradication. When looking into mosquito eradication, there are a number of different factors we must investigate. The health impact, the social impact, and the environmental impact. Let's look into the environmental impact of eradicating mosquitoes across the world. On one hand, these mosquito eradication efforts help protect the health of our populations, but a lot of research needs to be done into if the removal of mosquitoes will impact other species. Maybe there is an organism that relies on mosquitoes as their food source. What happens to them when we remove all the mosquitoes? This is one area of the research done in mosquito eradication. Now let's look into what the research on the social impact of mosquito eradication looks like. To do this, let's go talk to a researcher who focuses on studying the social impact of mosquito eradication. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. Jay Sudweeks. He currently works at Georgia Southern University and studies mosquitoes and their impact on society. Our first question to you is how did you decide to get into this field in the first place? One of the areas I was really interested in was um you know, have any of these promises of molecular biology and genetic engineering been fulfilled, right? Or have we taken care of any of the hunger issues, the disease issues? And and then, you know, a little bit had been taken care of, but in general, what I found was is that there was just a lot of confusion out there, a lot of resistance to the technology, um, and, you know, what, what appeared to be a lot of mistruths or misinformation being generated. And so that really interested me. And so I went and got a PhD in public administration from NC State, you know, North Carolina State University. And there I joined a program called the Genetic Engineering and Society Program. And they basically, it's a, it's a focus group of uh, natural scientists, social scientists, economists that kind of look at this question of the interaction of genetic engineered organism with society. So I uh, got a PhD there and my focus on that research was uh, the release of genetically modified mosquitoes, right? And so that's what I was interested in it from a policy perspective and in, in certain per, uh, certain perspectives around why why mosquitoes were released some places and not released other places. You know? Let's do a quick recap of his career journey. He started by pursuing a bachelor's of science degree. 
Then he took on a master's of science degree. Then he decided to work in the private sector for a number of years before completing a PhD in genetic engineering and finally studying GMO mosquitoes. Now let's learn some more about his work today. What does your research into mosquito eradication look like? When people start talking about policy, like the release of mosquitoes, um, lots of times they just don't present a bunch of facts and data, right? They actually tell stories, they tell narratives around why they like a particular, or why they like a particular policy, whether to release or not release it, right? So I was very interested in what they call these policy narratives around the release of mosquitoes. And inside of the policy process uh, discipline, there's a, there's a, there's a, theory called the narrative policy framework, which helps you identify um, what various policy narratives, strategies that are people are using, like the types of words and those types of things, right? And so my research really was, it's more qualitative. And so I went in and read like newspaper articles or press releases and those types of things and classified, you know, looking at the people who opposed it and the people who supported it. And look, reading through those documents, identifying what strategies that they used, you know, whether they relied upon science or, or other information. This leads us to our main question from the perspective of science. How can we anticipate and address the potential impacts of mosquito eradication? Now let's move on to looking at how mosquito eradication impacts society. Mosquitoes are found across the globe, but they don't impact each area the same way. Because this is a global issue, we can compare, do societal factors change the way that mosquito eradication is perceived? Let's compare two countries, Brazil and the United States of America. Both of these countries deal with mosquitoes, but they handle these populations in different ways. In Brazil, there's a lot higher of a disease burden than in the United States. This can lead to society perceiving mosquito eradication in Brazil as more important than in the United States. This might mean that Brazil would be more willing to do mosquito eradication than the United States. Let's talk to Dr. Sudweeks about this issue. How does society decide when it's worth it to intervene in mosquito control? You know, the mosquitoes were allowed to be released in Brazil and that disease, and the, you know, in uh, Zika and dengue in particular is endemic in Brazil, right? And so there's much greater want or need to release those mosquitoes, right? Because they didn't, they didn't have a lot of money to do spraying. Um, they, they didn't have a lot of, they, they had open windows, they had standing water all over, right? And so if you think about it from a Brazilian perspective, they would really want that technology, right? Because it's an endemic disease. Everybody gets sick every year. They lose a lot of work. And if you go back and look, say in um, Florida, you know, the Florida Keys, where this is taking place, is actually a very uh, wealthy place. They spend a couple million dollars every year spraying for mosquitoes already. People have windows and all screens and all those types of things. So you could potentially see why people wouldn't want to necessarily release mosquitoes, right? So in Brazil, it was very different. And in the United States, there was a lot more concern around, you know, this, I don't, I don't want, your, do, want you to do your experimentation in my backyard, right? I mean, you know, Lots of people concerned about whether the mosquitoes would, could cause potential disease, what the impact would be. The idea is to get rid of all of the mosquitoes, get rid of all of the mosquitoes, basically crash the population. And so there are lots of people who have concerns, well, if you kill off all these mosquitoes, you know, are there things feeding on them that would die off? You know, and there are some people that would say, is it our right to kill the mosquitoes, right? And is it our right to actually genetically modify an organism? So there's lots of different questions around why you would potentially release and not release mosquitoes. And so depending on the viewpoint that you came from and the area that you came from, there's lots of different interactions, right? And so for lots of, for, for some people, the idea of getting rid of disease probably just wasn't as important as other concerns around changing mosquitoes, potential ramifications. A lot of people were concerned there hadn't been enough testing. And so they, they didn't think they should be released. Whereas other people were saying, you know, these things are safe, we should, we should release them and they're going to get rid of them. the mosquitoes that should get rid of disease. This leads us to our main question from the society perspective. What are the ethics of choosing to eradicate an organism for perceived human benefit? Now let's move on to our final perspective on mosquito eradication, 
let's explore the government's role in mosquito eradication. To start this, let's ask Dr. Sudweeks. How do governments currently regulate the release of GMO mosquitoes? Yeah, so I, I mean, this is highly regulated, right? So the release of genetically modified organisms in any country is highly regulated. Some people will say it's not regulated enough and others will tell you that it's overregulated, right? So in both of these instances, you, they, you had to get government approval to release them, right? And so really the, the key point or the decision point in the research was, is did the government, you know, approve the release of the mosquitoes or did the government not approve the release of the mosquitoes, right? So it's very regulated. You have to produce lots of data and um, to answer government's questions, right? And one of the interesting things that when you think about government is, is that in the United States, in the Florida Keys, the, at the time it was the, um, I think it was the, F, it was the uh, FDA basically came out and said, you can release the mosquitoes. You know, we've gone in and done an analysis. It doesn't look like they're going to harm the human health. They're not going to harm the environment. So you can go ahead and release them. So that was at the national level. But if you looked at the local level, there was a lot of um, protest around the release of the mosquitoes, a lot of grassroots advocacy, right? So basically what happened, happened was is that the, the board that's responsible for the approval said, what we're going to do is we're going to put this we're going to put this up for referendum. We're going to let the people vote as to whether they want the mosquitoes released or not, right? They felt that was the most equitable way to have it done. And so, and the way they did the voting is they voted in the town where the mosquitoes were going to be released. And then they voted in the county where the mosquitoes were going to be released. And the people in the town voted no to the release of the mosquitoes. And the people in the county voted yes to the release of the mosquitoes, right? So basically what happened is, 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 the, is the Mosquito Control Board said, well, we said that this, we, we would follow, they called it a non-binding referendum, but they actually, but most of the board members said, we will go with what the citizens say. And so what happened was, is that because at the local level, they didn't want the mosquitoes released, the FDA came back and said, uh, well, you can't, you can't release these mosquitoes now. In this particular area, you can go someplace else, right? So, so the key thing here is that, when you start talking about release of certain types of genetic organisms beyond plants and crops and stuff like that, plants are harvested every year, right? And so they're not released in the environment and they don't persist. Mosquitoes are some of the first organisms that actually persist in the environment, right? Um, for at least a certain period of time. So when you start talking about persistent organisms and organisms that can move, all of a sudden local governments and local agencies and people beyond regulatory agencies are going to be very interested in the release. With all of this information being considered, let's look into an update on what Florida has decided to do. They have committed to releasing 700 million GMO mosquitoes in 2021 and 2022. But this isn't only a local issue. In fact, the World Health Organization has recently released a statement on their opinions on GMO mosquitoes. Their statement is as follows. The WHO recognizes the urgent need for development and testing of new tools to combat vector-borne diseases and supports investigation of all new potential control technologies, including genetically modified mosquitoes. Let's look at this problem from the context of COVID-19. When the world was faced with this novel viral threat, there was a lot of decisions to be made about how and where to spend our money. This is because disease eradication costs money and resources. If we had unlimited time and unlimited resources, maybe we would be able to eradicate more diseases. In the real world, this means that governments have to prioritize which diseases they would like to eradicate first. This discussion leads us to our main question from the government perspective. What factors must governments balance when allocating resources to the prevention of infectious diseases? With the help of this pamphlet, you've now explored mosquito eradication from the perspective of science, society, government, and industry. What are your thoughts on mosquito eradication and its impacts on the world? Thank you for watching this Genomics and Society video by GenomeBC. If you would like to see more Gene School content, go to genomebc.ca/education.